Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies and Director of our Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy here at CSAS. And it's wonderful for all of you to come out this afternoon for our conversation about China's uh, commercial aircraft industry. Uh, this is part of our China Innovation uh, Policy Series. I think this is correct, and I'm doing it the right way. Um, and we've uh, been, this is a multi-year uh, pro project aimed at looking at uh, China's efforts to innovate across many high-tech domains. And the gap that we're trying to fill is to look not just at what Chinese ambitions are, but to compare China's ambitions to the actual outcomes. Because our view is that American policy, the strategy of American companies, in these sectors ought to be based not just on what Chinese ambitions are, but what on the results are. Uh, and that's critically important in the conversation we're going to have today about China's aviation sector. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of Made in China 2025. Uh, they're very good at marketing and advertising in China, perhaps too good. And as you know, the Chinese have set ambitious targets to capture domestic market share in a whole variety of high-tech industries. Uh, and if you look at the very bottom of this slide, you'll see that even in aircraft, in commercial aircraft, where they have a very, very tiny share of the market in China now, um, they have goals to get to 5% by 2020 in two years and 10% and by 2025. Uh, that looks like a small market share compared to where they are in these other sectors, uh, but that's still going to be a big challenge, as you're going to hear today. Uh, I'm going to give a presentation uh, on the work that we've been doing uh, the last uh, several months looking at China's aviation sector, and then I'm going to be joined by three guests, uh, all of whom are much deeper experts on the aerospace sector than I am. Uh, I'm going to wait uh, to give them a proper introduction until they join on the stage, uh, but you'll find that, uh, that Doug, Susan, and Todd know more about aviation globally and in China than, than I could ever expect to know, uh, no matter how long I, I work on the industry. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to fake it as well as I can today. Um, the, the basic story, I think, um, that we're going to find is, is that ambitions have never been matched by reality uh, and that the pros possibilities of that are still uh, pretty far into the future. If you look at China, one of China's first efforts to make a civilian aircraft, it actually achieved more success than people realize. The, uh, the Chinese came out with a plane in the early 1980s, the Yunshu, uh, uh, and the, it's a Model Y-10. Uh, and it flew 170 test flights, or 170 hours of test flights. Uh, but the Chinese got cold feet. They were really worried that if the plane went down and it was their plane, uh, that that would really uh, crush people's confidence in China and the, and the political leadership. And so they mothballed this plane. So you can still go to uh, museums in China and see the plane, uh, but it never went into commercial service. Oops. Hey, um, I obviously pressed a wrong button, so you're going to help me out. There we go. All right. I promise not to do that again. All right. So, um, so as I mentioned, this is one of several uh, reports that we're writing about the different sectors. And um, after the Chinese uh, mothballed the, the Yunshu, uh, they worked with McDonnell Douglas for a few years on a plane, uh, but McDonnell Douglas was acquired by Boeing, and that basically was the end of that project. Uh, more recently, uh, the Chinese have uh, launched two other efforts uh, for a regional jet, the ARJ-21, and a narrow-body, longer commercial jet, uh, the C919, which is similar to uh, the Boeing 737 and the Airbus, Airbus A320. Um, the company that is building these planes uh, is uh, COMAC, a commercial aircraft company of China, 
and uh, which is a child of, of AVIC, which has long been uh, overseen China's aviation and aerospace sector on the defense side uh, for many years. Now, there's good reason to be optimistic about what the Chinese are doing in this effort. Uh, China has uh, highly capable military aircraft, um, not peer competitors to the most advanced American aircraft, but they have their own uh, fighter jets, uh, stealth technology uh, that are, are highly capable uh, and are quite challenging for American defense planners to respond against. Um, and you can go to the China Power uh, website that's part of CSIS and, and read more about uh, these aircraft. In addition to that, there's huge demand in China for commercial aircraft. The Chinese are flying more than anybody, and it's been increasing rapidly. If you look at the number of passengers in China, the number of commercial aircraft and uh, air routes that are in use, uh, it's been rising rapidly, and the expectation is for aircraft demand in China to continue to rise dramatically and for it to be the dominant market in the world for at least another decade, if not longer. So you can see the number of routes, uh, the number of uh, domestic and international in, in China, uh, the number of flights in, that are now far into the over a four million flight, commercial flights in China last year. Uh, and that has given rise to a lot of successful, profitable Chinese airlines that fly domestically all over China uh, and between China and the rest of the world, um, including many cities in the United States, Europe, and, and beyond. Um, and these airlines, if you fly on them, you'll find they have pretty good service, compete just as well on that as uh, airlines from elsewhere. A third reason to be optimistic about what the Chinese are doing is um, the politics. Um, the political leadership in China, uh, including Xi Jinping, has made China's development of a successful commercial aircraft a very, very high priority. To spare no expense, uh, spend and spend as long as it takes uh, to not, and not be worried about profitability in the short term uh, because achieving this goal is such an important national mission. Uh, and so Xi Jinping has staked his personal uh, success, political success, on the success of the, these aircraft and on COMAC. Visited the company numerous times. Uh, and so this is something which you, you couldn't find a higher priority uh, in China uh, than the success of these aircraft. And lastly, uh, another reason for optimism is that China has been successful in other big transportation projects. High-speed rail. China has the most successful high-speed rail uh, program in the world. The longest number, uh, the tracks that stretch as far as you can see, crisscrossing the country, um, thousands of these uh, trains in operation. Uh, they had uh, one serious accident in 2011 uh, in Zhejiang near Wenzhou, but otherwise a, a clear safety record, and the Chinese have been exporting a lot of their high-speed rail as well. And if any of you ever fly, uh, go between Washington, D.C. and New York or Boston, uh, you really wish sometimes when you're sitting on Amtrak that instead you could go on Chinese high-speed rail. Um, so for a variety of reasons, one ought to be optimistic about the Chinese effort. Nevertheless, uh, I'm not uh, as optimistic as, as those reasons should make me. Uh, this year I've traveled around China uh, visiting uh, COMAC and other Chinese companies, including AVIC, uh, a lot of the foreign partners uh, that are working with them on these planes, uh, also talking to experts uh, in industry, in government in China, interviewing people outside China, um, and uh, enjoying these visits. Uh, really uh, appreciate all the openness that people have shown me, uh, but not walking away optimistic. 
Let me say a little bit about the two planes that COMAC has uh, been working on. First is the ARJ-21, which actually was started uh, before COMAC came into being, which was in 2008. Uh, so AVIC uh, launched the ARJ-21 program in 2003. It had its first deliveries uh, 12 years after that in 2015. There are all of 10 aircraft in service now, uh, which is not a big number. Um, they fly on two routes, uh, but because uh, they were bought by Sichuan Airlines, uh, these 10 aircraft fly between Shanghai and Chengdu, and, and Chengdu and Harbin. Uh, I'm told by people that follow this plane that it's not a very safe plane, that it has lots of problems that are embedded in the design of the plane, not just how it was built or maintenance problems that emerged down the road, but in the basic design of the plane. Now, why did, Chengdu, why did Sichuan Airlines buy this plane? Well, it's because it's 50% owned by Comac. Uh, now, you would understand, being based in Chengdu and the plane originally being uh, manufactured in Shanghai, they would have fly between Chengdu and Shanghai, but why Harbin? It's kind of strange. It's a, that's a new route they opened up this year. Uh, and that's because the original chairman of Comac, the gentleman who led the company at the very beginning, uh, is now the party secretary of Heilongjiang province, the city in which Harbin is located. So he's helping out his former company, which is all part of the same party controlled system, by introducing some of these aircraft to this new route. There's no international orders, as I am aware, for the ARJ-21, uh, none by American Airlines, uh, and that's because it's not certified by the FAA. Um, maybe it will be, uh, but I don't see that on the horizon. If you look at the C-919, development for that plane began in 2008. Uh, there have been three test flights. Um, it was originally scheduled for delivery, I believe, in 2015, perhaps 2016. But delivery of the first plane and to be put into commercial service is probably still at least three years away. Uh, they keep pushing back the date by the time the plane will be delivered. Uh, and once you deliver a plane, then you need to build multiple planes. Then you need to service those planes. Uh, that's a big job. Uh, and that's still far out on the horizon for the Chinese. CAAC, China's aviation safety regulator, and the FAA uh, signed an agreement last year implementing uh, an agreement they've had in, uh, around for about 20 years to implement a, a, a way for them to collaborate or work together on helping Chinese planes uh, go through the process of being certified by the FAA. But uh, China has not put forward the C919 for certification yet, um, and they haven't like sent a save the date postcard yet to let the FAA know that that is coming. Uh, so I still think uh, that is uh, well off into the future. Official orders, the, uh, C8, the C919 apparently has 815 orders for the plane, and I, I've listed all of the companies that have put in orders for the plane. On the left, you've got leasing companies, which is a big business in the world. Lease a plane and then and give it to airlines to use. Uh, and then some airlines on the right. 800 something, that's a big number. Uh, my sense is that the actual number uh, is zero. I don't think there's a single plane that's really on order because for a plane to really be on order, one would have to pay a deposit and sign in a, a, a binding contract that once the plane comes, you'll pay for it. And not one of those exists yet. So good theater to say that in general, there's a lot of interest in the plane, should it ever exist and come onto the market. But in reality, that's good to imply that there will be success, but, doesn't, but it's really not really uh, uh, proof of, of anything yet. So if you look at the global market share of, of different companies, you're going to see that the big four, Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, Bombardier, dominate uh, the global market for commercial aircraft. 
the Chinese uh, COMAC and its ARJ 21's 10 aircraft are a tiny, tiny little blip in this market. Make sure I'm going the direct, correct direction. So then the question is, why has there been failure? Uh, and I really have sort of a three-pronged answer uh, to this, of why things have not worked out. The first is technology. Um, aircraft technology is ridiculously complicated. Um, the engine is difficult. The avionics are equally challenging. Integrating that technology altogether is even more challenging. Uh, here's a list of the suppliers for the C919 and the ARJ21. And the international companies, the non-Chinese companies, are in red. That's a big proportion of the suppliers. And this is just the tier one suppliers. There's usually three tiers. Uh, and if you go to their websites, you can see the different tiered suppliers and, and, you can, and where they come from. If you look at just a part of the selected suppliers for the C919, the foreign companies, you can see the types of technologies that they are providing to the plane. This is the, this is, these technologies that foreign companies are providing is what keeps the plane in the air. Without these technologies, you would have essentially a shell of a plane. And you wouldn't necessarily have the shell of the plane because even a lot of the shell is produced by, comes from others. So uh, people talk about the ZTE problem, right? ZTE lost access to some chips, uh, potentially, uh, in April. That was going to happen, and then uh, didn't. ZTE is in a way, way better position than COMAC. Uh, here's another way to look at the suppliers uh, for the C919 uh, and, and who, who supplies what and how important they are. Take away some of those things and see how the plane continues to do. It's, 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 it would be a challenge. If you look at the specs of the C919 and compare it to the other planes, the A320, uh, the Boeing, Boeing 737 MAX, you're going to notice some similarities. These are not similarities by mere chance. Uh, when Comac was building its plane, it looked at others and said, we want planes that are very similar to these. The only difference, big difference that I can see is that the range of, the, of Comac's plane is a lot shorter than for the, uh, its competitors. I think I, one of the things I'm real curious as to why the Chinese media says it's simply because the distances needed to fly in the domestic market in China are relatively short, so they, don't, they can have a lighter plane, have a shorter range. But I wonder if there's actually a technical challenge uh, for them as well. The second challenge, uh, beside technology, is organization and people. Um, this is a uh, plane which is developed um, by uh, Comac, a child of AVIC, which is born out of the People's Liberation Army. And the PLA is really good at one task, vertical control. They are not good at the task which is required of a company that's going to make a commercially successful uh, aircraft, and that is horizontal coordination. You have over 100,000 parts from over a thousand companies that are spread around the world and the company that puts all this stuff together has to be able to coordinate all of those parts and organizations in a systematic way uh, without just issuing orders but with figuring out ways to collaborate and that's very difficult for COMAC to do uh, given the it's where it comes from very different than Airbus and Boeing and how they operate um, and the skills that they have developed over the decades to coordinate the making of a plane. If Alibaba, instead of Comac, was responsible for making this plane, Alibaba has the corporate culture to coordinate. 
Uh, in the pharmaceutical sector, uh, I've looked at a lot of Chinese companies. They have a similar type of culture of being able to coordinate, of being able to understand what international standards are like uh, and, and adapt to them pretty quickly. Um, another sector that we're looking at. It's much harder uh, for COMAC to do that. Uh, maybe over generations they will adapt, but in this generation, this current generation, it's quite different. And, and going to COMAC, visiting COMAC, uh, I felt that. I felt like I was going back in time. Even though it was a fancy building uh, and uh, people were very nice, it really felt like I was walking into a party organization. And in fact, the scenes that they had for me to see, you know, the exhibition center, it just looked straight out of of party history casting 101. It was so different than in when I've gone to other companies, even to other state-owned companies in different sectors. It, r despite the, 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 the price of the building, it, uh, COMAC really, and COMAC's probably better than AVIC in terms of its, um, the way it engages uh, outsiders and operates. But nevertheless, that organization uh, seems to be a super huge uh, challenge. Third is certification. Uh, the USFAA only directly has authority to certify whether a, a, a plane can be purchased and put into service by an American-based carrier. And of course, these planes don't necessarily have to be sold to an American carrier to go into commercial service, of course. But the FAA is actually the world's de facto regulator of the industry. And everyone looks to the FAA as the, not just the gold standard, the platinum standard. And the FAA are safety zealots, like ridiculously high standards. And I've interacted with lots of other American regulators, international organizations that have uh, worked in China and worked with the Chinese. And I have to tell you that compared to everybody else, the FAA, they, have, they don't bend at all. They are real pain, they're real tough, real hardliners, consistently. Uh, no phase in periods for adaptation, no 70% and then 80% and 90%. It's 100% now or no check mark. And that is a very, very tough hurdle for the Chinese to get over. Uh, and, and, so, and, and they haven't. Uh, and that has really stopped them uh, from uh, being successful. Now, um, the global safety record for aircraft now is, is almost perfect, not quite, but it's very high. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way the FAA operates, that hard line, zealous enforcement of safety in the way that uh, they regulate um, is um, good for the flying public, but it's bad for company up and coming companies that are trying to get into the market that come from a very different uh, institutional culture and would prefer to be able to have just issue an instruction to the regulator and have the industrial policy regulators tell the safety regulator what to do. But that's not really how the FAA operates. Now, the Chinese aren't stopping at the C919. They're now working on another plane, the CR929. That R is for Russia. And the Ch Chinese and the Russians, uh, a few years ago, uh, signed a, an agreement to create a new company, a joint venture, which would build a wide body aircraft to compete with the A380, the 787, other wide body aircraft around the world. And as you can look, if you, I'm sorry it's too small, but you can see at the very end of that po table back there is Xi Jinping and, and uh, Putin uh, endorsing this. Uh, they weren't just endorsing it, they were leading the charge for this joint venture to be created. Now the Russians are very good in technology, in engine technology, and things, but they aren't necessarily gonna be able to overcome those other types of challenges that China has had with the ARJ-21 and the C919 because this isn't simply an engineering problem. This is about organizations, about people, um, about international standards um, and those systems. So 
as much as a, there is a challenge for the C919 still laying in front of it, I think you're going to have the same kind of problems, if not more, when you get to the CR929. So what could change all this? Uh, what could change those three factors? Uh, the technology, organizations, regulation. So if you start the technology, it's possible it may be easier to manufacture some of these, uh, par the parts of an airplane going forward. 3D printing could help address some of the manufacturing po possibilities uh, for some of these aircraft. It's also possible that the Chinese, that electrification will come to the industry. Uh, and that instead of needing the jet engine, you'll have different types of propulsion systems. And instead of having large aircraft that carry hundreds of people at a time, maybe you'll have smaller aircraft that are more like drones, uh, but sort of configured differently. In short, maybe we'll have the Jetsons. Maybe the aircraft industry will shift dramatically in the type of technology that propels planes uh, and the way people get from one place to another. And maybe that will make things a little bit easier for the Chinese, reduce the technological or market hurdles. And of course, as we saw yesterday with the indictment handed down, the Chinese are really working hard uh, in the front door and then the back door legally and illegally to acquire technology to defeat, to overcome some of these challenges. But they are a very serious challenge. And maybe we're closer to the Jetsons than I realize. Uh, I'm a little old school. So, uh, but that still seems like a difficult challenge. Maybe uh, China will change things organizationally. Perhaps instead of uh, COMAC having this job, uh, maybe they'll open it up for bidding and say, which Chinese company would like to jump into this business and try and be the successful aircraft manufacturer? Maybe Alibaba or Tencent uh, or some other company we have yet to hear of that doesn't have the same type of organizational challenges that Comac has will, will jump into the fray uh, and, and be more successful. Regula Regulation-wise, maybe the FAA will change its mind and decide 70% is good enough for right now. Next year we'll ask 90% compliance, 90, 95 the next year until we get to 100%. Or maybe we'll just give a break for new companies uh, and give them more of a chance regardless of the implications because we want to promote innovation uh, even if it raises some, some risks. I think that's probably really unlikely. Um, it's also possible that China and others will decide, forget the FAA, forget EASA, the, the European regulator. We've got a big enough market at home. CAC has already learned how to be a good safety regulator on its own. We'll just do this at home and just bypass. And in other parts of global regulation and governance, the Chinese have been creating alternative rules. Maybe they'll just have different types of rules and systems with regard to aerospace. Possible, but nevertheless, safety is important, not just to you and me, but to your Chinese flying public. Uh, and so regardless of whether the Chinese are looking to the FAA or someone else, safety is still gonna matter because if you have accidents, uh, people won't fly on the planes. They'll find other ways to get there, maybe on rail. So I, at the end of the day, come down relatively pessimistic, especially compared to the other sectors uh, where I've been doing research and looking at the Chinese. They may uh, crack this, uh, and in 10 years, in 20 years, uh, they may be successful. Uh, but it, it's, compared to other industries, it's more of an outlier. It's more of a challenge for them. Um, now. We're 40 years into China's economic opening and reform, and every several years, China looks like it's gonna have a big crisis and people say, oh, it's over. They're not gonna make it. Uh, we told you they couldn't do it this way. And then they find some solution to that problem. Um, and we're kind of sitting at that intersection right now in terms of looking at China's economy and its relationship with the rest of the world. 
uh, and people are doubting China, and I'm doubting them with regard to this project in aviation, I'm ready to be proven wrong. I'm ready to be proven that maybe there's a different way to do things, but I want to see it. I want to see it done, and then I'll change my mind. Not look into the future, but look at the present. All right, so that's my presentation. Uh, that's uh, where I come down on this. Uh, but as I told you, um, I'm just looking at this sector for the first time. Uh, and luckily, I have with me three people who are spending their lives working in the aerospace industry. So uh, we're going to move away this podium, and I'm going to invite my three guests to come onto the stage. Thank you very much. Th thanks for putting up with me for the, to the first part of this program um, and uh, listening to the initial presentation. Um, and I don't like to be gloom and doom. And I think that was more gloom than doom. Uh, uh, but I don't even like to, to do that. I like to be optimistic. Uh, and I think mo in many areas of Chinese technology, there's reasons to be more optimistic. Uh, but I, 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 sh I am at most the first word today uh, we've got the last word here with me. Let me introduce to you my three guests. To my immediate left is Doug Harned, who is Managing Director at Sanford C. Bernstein & Company, a New York-based investment research and management firm dealing with brokerage and global equity trading. He's led coverage of global aerospace and defense for Ber Bernstein since 2005. Many consider Doug to be one of the world's leading authorities in the investment community of the global aerospace sector. Prior to his work at Bernstein, he was a partner at McKinsey & Company in Los Angeles, New York, and Moscow, and a senior scientist at SAIC in California. He holds a PhD in nuclear engineering from UC Berkeley, an MBA from the Wharton School, and most important to me, because my son also went there, a BS from Northwestern. To his left is Susan Ng, who is Vice President of Technology, Strategy, and International Relations at Ampere, a Los Angeles-based startup that is developing electrified aircraft. She is also President of the International Council of Aeronautical Sciences. Susan has two engineering degrees, not just one, from Stanford and another from Cornell, and 35 years of work in the global aerospace industry, including at Boeing and NASA. But even more interesting for our purposes today, uh, she also worked for a few years at COMAC, based in Shanghai. Susan specializes in large-scale integration of aerospace programs, especially in international collaborations in design, development, manufacturing, testing, and regulatory issues. In addition, Susan has over 1,000 hours of pilot in-command flight experience. So she's going to pilot us through this conversation. <laughs> Bada bing. That's as humorous as I can get. <laughs> Ask my kids. Well time. <laughs> Lastly, down at the end, Todd Siena, who is a Shanghai-based aerospace professional, who is recognized as one of the top 40, under 40 executives by McGraw-Hill's Financial, Financials Aviation Week Science and Technology. Todd comes from the leading edge of the millennial cohort with over a decade of experience executing on projects in commercial aerospace manufacturing, MRO, aftermarket, and finance. He's the founder of Aviatech, a successful trading and consulting company that counts multinationals, state-owned enterprises, airlines, and large financial institutions amongst its customers. Uh, he's lived in mainland China and elsewhere in Asia, speaks Chinese, holds a bachelor's degree in Asian studies and entrepreneurship from UNC Chapel Hill. He was awarded the Stedman Award for Entrepreneurship and a Fellowship with the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. He recently founded Block Aero Technologies, a blockchain SAAS startup, utilizing artificial intelligence to revolutionize how we manage aviation assets. And perhaps he may be developing some of the solutions that will help 
China and other startups develop the aircraft. Thank you all for being here today. It's really an honor that uh, you all have, have come to Washington for this conversation. Uh, what I thought I would do is, is, is give each of them a few minutes. Uh, I've asked, I've in advance given them a question to think about um, to get the conversation started. In part, they can react to some of the things that I said, but in, in addition, they come with their own experiences and views of, a, of the aerospace sector. And I didn't want to limit them just to responding to some uh, comments from a beginner like me. So let me start with Doug. Um, since you've looked at the aircraft sector of many countries, it'd be helpful for you to start by giving the audience perhaps a, a global context for China's effort. Why have Boeing and Airbus managed to do so well and why, Embra why is Embraer and Bombardier managed to be successful entrants? while aircraft firms in Russia and Indonesia and perhaps elsewhere have been less successful. Are there any positive signs that you see from China's effort that give you more optimism than myself? Doug? Okay, um, thanks Scott. And, I, and I, um, I have to say that did not look like a beginner's presentation. I thought that was uh, a good summary, a good description of where uh, COMAC is today. And I share some of the concerns that Scott raised. Um, you know, China's been trying to build an aircraft industry for some time, and Scott referred to the effort on the way back on the MD-80 with McDonnell Douglas and then um, the ARJ-21, but we're now at a, at a stage with COMAC that with the C919, this has real momentum and real political force behind it. So it's an, an initiative, I think, that at the start one might think could be prepared for some success. Uh, and when I look at countries starting national initiatives to create an aircraft industry, usually what they do is they pick out Airbus and Embraer and they say these are examples where countries started from nothing, they created this whole industry, and we can emulate that. I don't think either one of those are very good examples for either China or for Russia. Um, and, and why I say that is if you look at, it, at Airbus, Airbus was formed out of British Aerospace, CASA, Deutsche Aerospace, Aerospatial. These were not insignificant companies in their own right. So you had a very, very good starting point there. And then you saw tens of billions of dollars, and we can debate how much money actually went in, uh, to get this up and form what became Airbus. That's something that I think neither, Rus neither Russia nor China has the resources to call a starting point like Airbus did. But second, you look at Embraer. Embraer started out in the 60s doing build-to-print production of Piper single-engine prop planes. It was 30 years before they actually sold an ERJ-145, a jet. So neither Russia nor China want to take that kind of a timeline and that kind of a starting point. So I, I look at their goals as much more ambitious. I was involved personally um, at Russia, in Russia for some time, did a number of projects in that industry. And I saw, uh, again there, some groups come together and say, we're going to create the Russian Airbus. Those did not work out at all. Um, and, and you look at Russia and China together, and, and to put China in some context here, you know, in both cases, in, in both cases, you're really look at, looking at national initiatives. These are politically driven. The countries themselves had communist origins, not really commercial capitalist ones. In each case, they had a large domestic market. And as Scott pointed out, the one that in China is very large, and it's the biggest source of growth today for the commercial aircraft industry. So each country felt that we can leverage that as the starting point. Our airlines in our own country will use this product, then that can be the basis for expansion globally. In both cases, I think the people that develop the, the plans here for, for these initiatives I think they were overconfident, and they didn't see some of the pitfalls. But I also, to their credit, I, I think they realized you had to go at, reach out to Western uh, companies as well. This couldn't be done in isolation. And that's why you've seen things like 
in both Russia and in China, particularly using Western engines, Western avionics. And I think that makes total sense. In, in the background, they would each have a program to develop their own engines and own avionics, but they wouldn't go on the first aircraft. And they, the C919 is like that. As Scott showed, they have many, 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 many Western suppliers. So another aspect of this uh, is safety. And, and I think you've got to, you know, Scott made the comment that, you know, in China, if the airplane is unsafe, that is not, not only is it not going to be acceptable for the FAA, it won't be acceptable for the Chinese themselves. And I remember seeing that in Russia, when if you had the opportunity to fly, say, on a Boeing 757 on a flight, or the opportunity to fly on a Tupolev 154, Russian citizens did not want to fly in the Russian airplane. They wanted to fly in the Boeing airplane. So when I looked at Russia and having spent a lot of time there with that industry, I think back to the first time I met with Comac, and it was in the early days of the C919. And Comac was interested in what I learned working in many of the, on many of these projects in Russia. And there were really, you know, I told them three things. I said, look, you just have to make sure you've got to get these three right. The first one is don't be late. You know, in other words, stay on schedule. And that is the number one thing. And uh, as uh, Scott described, they're already way behind on the C919, so there's a lot of work there. Focus on integration. There are lots of technologies, but it's the integration of things that is the hardest part of an aircraft program. And third, to ensure the program is commercially driven by real customers, not politically driven. So you know, first on the point of being late, there, there are two reasons that that's a disaster. Okay, the first one is that if you're late, Boeing and Airbus aren't standing still. They will, catch, they, they will continue to progress. And so you may get your airplane out, and you're out five years late, what you thought on paper was competitive is no longer competitive. And if you look today, Boeing is in the process of the new midsize airplane. They may or may not launch that. But if they do in 2025, put it in service, and the C919 doesn't come out until after 2021, they have a problem there. But that's only part of, part of the problem because the other one is you're looking to depend on your domestic market taking this airplane. But if you're late, your airlines get better. And I, I think it's fair to say the Chinese, the big three Chinese airlines today are okay. They are certainly not world-class airlines. Aeroflot was not either. Aeroflot's a very good airline today. Aeroflot, when the Aleutian 96 came out, they had to buy it. But what happened? They said to the Kremlin, this is an embarrassment flying this airplane. It's our, we're the flag carrier, and our competitors are flying 777s, they're flying A330s. The Kremlin said, no, 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 you've got to fly our plane. But, you know, I, and it may have something to do with Putin lost, lost an engine on the presidential Aleutian 96, and not long after they said, well, okay, you can, you can stop flying those. And they did, so Aeroflot doesn't fly those anymore. The Chinese carriers could actually end up very much in the same place. And if you look at the ARJ-21, none of the major airlines in China have taken them. They're just flown by Chengdu right now, which is affiliated with Comac. So what happens here? The C919 gets later, gets later and later. I think if you were in a quiet place with, with a leader of China Eastern, or China, China Southern, they, they would not say that they want to be flying a C919 up against a 737 or A320 that their competitors may be flying. So there's a real question here, can China capture its own market? Because every year, Boeing and Airbus are each delivering more than 150 airplanes into that market. So a second point, the second point on integration. And this is so important. Scott put up that map of suppliers. You can, I believe that you could see the, the Chinese industry, any single component of an airplane they could do. They could develop or get the IP for it and they could do it. But there's no IP you can steal that tells you how 
to do supplier management of a thousand suppliers around the world. There's no, nothing that will really help you develop the system integration skills you need. And these are the things that are such a challenge. And if you go back to the ARJ, which, came, which was supposed to go in service originally in 2008, ended up in 2016, um, and you ask what went wrong, they'll tell you, I will bet it was the supplier's fault. And that's what I've heard, and I think it's true. They were unable to make sure that every supplier was on time, meeting cost and quality standards. It's very hard to do. And I think that's the challenge that they're going to face at COMAC as well. So the third point, though, is this commercial focus. And uh, you can see in, I think, some of the slides that Scott showed made it very clear. There's a huge political aspect to this program. And that was true in Russia, too. So what sometimes happens is you see the leaders of these programs, they have milestones they have to meet, but those milestones tend to be political ones. It could be complete a factory by a certain date, get the plane flying by a certain date, but those are just simply the, what the leaders need to get done. They aren't necessarily what you optimally need, optimally need to get done to make it a successful program. So I guess I, I would say, you know, if you can make it through those three challenges, which are hard, there still are a couple other things. One is, to really make it a, a success, you need to go to high volume manufacturing. This is hard. And in fact, Boeing and Airbus are each having difficulty with it right now as they take rate right up on their narrow bodies. But the second thing is service and support. Because you need to establish a network that can provide uh, service, spares, all of those things. And that's quite hard. Now, COMEX is well aware of that. So, uh, but I think actually executing on it is going to be very challenging. So, as I look at it here, I mean, China is willing to put a lot of resources into this. They probably ultimately, ultimately will be successful, but I think the big question is how long it's going to take. The C929 or CR929 I don't think is the answer. To me, that looks more difficult even than the C919. So for me, it's a question, can you meet these challenges? How long do you get something that really can take hold and become, a, a, I'd say, a real commercial airplane? Super. Thanks so much, Doug. That's terrific. Uh, very helpful. Uh, I appreciate your kind remarks about the, some of my slides. Um, Susan, let me ask you, um, given your experience uh, in NASA, Boeing, uh, and COMAC, and, and now the new startup, what's the Chinese aircraft industry look like to you from the ground level uh, in terms of organization and, and people? Um, I know you can't provide us all the details of what it was like to work inside uh, COMAC. But f at a general level, how did it feel like? How did it look like? What changes do you see on the horizon that may portend positive changes uh, for China? I think we've got your slides already to roll. So if you just hit the next one, you'll, you'll get it. Do, can I stand up? To sure, go ahead. Uh, yes, otherwise, sure. I of can't course. see my own slides. <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, oops. Oh, keep going. A couple more. One more. Oh, there you go. There. All right. Okay, so this is just a cover chart that I have recently used back in China um, by the invitation of the uh, Chinese uh, Aeronautics uh, Society to um, do some forward thinking on what the uh, aeronautics will become. So uh, right now we're having the third revolution in aeronautics or in aviation. So uh, it's a very, very exciting time, and particularly in China. Um, so let's see. Um, I was asked to uh, sort of comment through my lenses on the people, the organization, and just from the ground level. So let's start from the people. Um, I worked for 20 years in Boeing. And uh, by the time I left, I left as a director for research and technologies. And um, I considered myself as sort of the average age employee at the time. Uh, I actually took an early retirement. The uh, average age back then was like 54. I think it's gone down a couple years by now for the average uh, for Boeing. But as soon as I landed in Shanghai, I was there for four years, last four years. 
Um, the typical uh, group of people that be working with uh, will be about this, this age group. And uh, so most of them are from 25 to 30 years old. And however, the uh, mid-level or higher level management people are about uh, 40, 50 some. And here you can see a couple older people or more mature, myself and my two colleagues from Boeing. Uh, so you can easily identify them, those who are foreign experts, what we call. <laughs> and um, however, the talent acquisition, the talent re uh, re re recruitment um, from not just Comac, but a lot of those uh, bigger uh, state-owned enterprises are really planned or maybe strategized is a better word and promoted from the very highest level. So uh, some of you might be familiar with the um, SAFIA program with the thousand talents uh, incentives. So they bring over these uh, very well recognized people and quite a few of them not from aerospace, but from other uh, physics and chemistry, they actually had Nobel Prizes. So I can say that I've met quite a few of Nobel Prize winners through this program. Um, so, and also while I was there, for example, this is uh, President Xi Jinping, for example, in the middle. And um, I actually got to meet him twice, and face-to-face, uh, -face, once with a face-to-face -face meeting. And that was, that was a meeting where um, quite a few of us uh, foreign experts were um, gathered together to talk to him about what we think of uh, the state of the art and also what's happening in our industry. Um, so for example, in that same meeting, uh, Patrick Power, uh, my FAA colleague in COMAC, was also there. And then uh, they gave us uh, recognition and awards such as the Friendship Award, which they picked around uh, 20 people or so from all around the country who are the foreign experts in the country. And so, for example, I met some really high caliber folks. Uh, for example, this one, uh, this is a friend of mine. He's now the CTO of now the world's largest battery makers, the battery manufacturers. His name is uh, Bob Galian. Uh, so very strategic and uh, promoted from the highest level. Um, and now inside Comac, there's quite a few uh, foreign experts, uh, we, I think around 100 or so. And so every year uh, we have some get together and um, the visit, so this is uh, Zhang Jianguo, this uh, tall gentleman here between me and then CEO uh, Jin Zhuanglong, Jin Zong. So um, we have uh, gatherings uh, every year and um, especially sometimes in the celebration, they kind of push us out to, to show the world that, hey, we have these international experts, you know, from FAA, from Boeing, from Airbus, um, Bombardier, uh, Embraer, and so on, who are on our staff. Um, but I was really hired there as the chief integration officer to help with the integration um, of the programs, not just the one program, but three programs. And I reported to uh, this, this is uh, He Dongfeng He Zong, who is now the CEO, but when I was hired, he was the president of the company. And uh, he's a very visionary leader. In fact, uh, of the whole COMAC on top, uh, in the top leaders uh, team, uh, this man, I think, is really brilliant, incredible. Um, and as you can see, this I was working with an Airbus uh, person there in that plot. And, um, so uh, Mr. He, he has a really hands-on sort of uh, 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 working style, leadership style. And um, so if it wasn't for him, it would have been impossible for me to work over there. Um, so uh, at least we know that from the very top level, they recognize this integration issue and they recognize they have to build an airplane that's up to the international standards. Um, and let me see, so these two, uh, this is Patrick and this is Serial. Uh, Serial's uh, from Boeing, uh, a noise expert, and Patrick uh, from FAA. So this is a celebration in fact, uh, event with uh, Jin Zhuanglong and He Dongfeng, the two uh, CEO, and C C uh, CEO and the president. And um, now Jin Zhuanglong is gone after the first flight of the uh, C919, and Mr. He is now the CEO. But this is a celebration, and guess what we're celebrating? The birth year. Well, it's a 
New Year's celebration. And how, how often do you get the company president? I mean, I bet at Boeing, we never did that, celebrating the birthday of the uh, employees uh, with the president and the uh, CEO. So this is the birth year, because for the Chinese, the um, year is more important than the date. Um, OK, so uh, that, that was the first part about the people, and now a little bit about organization and the product development. So um, Comac has a lot of the global suppliers, as mentioned, and I agree a lot with what um, Doug and Scott had just mentioned regarding the challenges there. Um, but also, another big motivation for uh, Comac is to try to dai dong in Chinese, or try to bring, out, bring up all the aerospace industry uh, from uh, domestic uh, industry. So um, for example, in the execution, uh, Comac has to get the local supplier together, working with the global supplier together. In many cases, I think now it's, uh, it's a mandatory. You have to have a JV in uh, local uh, in China in order to work with them. And so here in Shanghai, there are just these uh, subsidiaries. And the way how the sub subsidiaries of uh, Comac uh, working together is more um, modeled after Airbus rather than Boeing. Boeing's, you know, the whole company we have one stock. It's, you know, business units while it's here is, is different. And very often, the people from one subsidiary does not know what the other subsidiary is about, what they do. And so, you know, when you talk about the product development, you know, moving smoothly from design, development, to manufacturing, to support, and so on, it's, it's uh, very big boundaries in between. But they're, they know that problem now, and it's uh, supposedly get, getting better. Um, so we just talked about the ARJ21, which took 12 years uh, from start to delivery. And in fact, it broke the record, which used to be uh, held by Concord. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the problem that within Comac, it was you know, studied a lot, and they really tried to better, uh, you know, in this case, also foreign experts are involved too, to try to understand how they can, they can improve. And um, so, of course, first thing you can say is that, oh, well, we have a very young workforce, and there's a lack of experience and so on. And indeed, with, uh, I think I saw Scott's chart showing 11,000 employees when this was done, it was like 10,000 employees. And for three programs, and now these are three parallel programs. So a lot of the people who work on the AR, ARJ and C919 and C929, um, they have no idea what people on the other teams are doing, or they didn't have any experience from previous, previous programs. And 75% um, of them are under 30. So uh, most of the people don't really have a whole complete uh, product life cycle type of experience. Um, but here, I guess you can see, you know, in this chart, there's actually quite a few ladies there. And yes, I found that there are more women in Comac than I was in Boeing. And there's a very simple reason. That is the benefits there for ladies are very, very good. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, another thing was that um, we talked about certification. So when we certified the airplane, um, I think there's quite a few from Boeing. Within Boeing, there's like at least hundreds, if not thousands, of DERs and DARs. Those are the designated uh, engineer representatives who work in concert with FAA to try to do the uh, certification. When I first got to COMAC, this was four years ago, I could count the number of DERs with one hand. And a couple of them are from, from uh, foreign experts. So that's another big challenge. Um, and once again, that's recognized. And so now there's, uh, they're developing these younger people to try to become DERs and DARs. But very often, uh, we found that the problem is really not technical. It's really not technology problem. In fact, I was hired not because of my technology background, but for my systems engineering and integration background. And so, um, very often you get people, they just kind of push away, saying, I'm really too busy, I'm up to here, I can't listen to you, and you know, it's not my problem. And I think just now we saw a couple of those. 
Um, so back in 2013 already, this is a, uh, I think uh, this analyst worked, worked closely with Boeing, some of you might know, uh, my friend Richard Ablafer. He already commented that you know, in the next decade, oh, at best, there will be like eight C919 delivered. Um, I think he was optimistic there. <laughs> he really was, because that was 2013, and now it's 2018, and 2023 is only a few years away. Um, so, uh, very good prediction there, but what about the future? So, um, just now I, I show the first chart being the third uh, revolution of aviation. So in the future, the airplanes are going to be more affordable, a lot more affordable, and it will be clean, no emit, you know, with a really high emission standards. In fact, in Europe for 2050, they have these really, really high uh, standards for those goals, and be quiet. Um, the noise, you know, for uh, a lot of the airports in the U.S., uh, the noise is really low, the level is really bad. And of course, all the future, you have all kinds of, you know, not, you might not just have those big airplanes, you have small airplanes, you have drones, you have VTOL airplanes, vertical takeoff and landing airplanes, that can come to your backyard to pick you up to go somewhere. So all, with all that, everything must work in the, um, in the system. And, you know, we're all connected, right? So that's the features of uh, future uh, aircraft. And what about the future aircraft industry? Well, aside from the traditional, the Airbus, Boeing, the Bombardier, and so on, in fact, quite a few of them are consolidating, but um, the potential non-traditional OEMs, you know, just now Scott talk, talked about Alibaba's or Tension. Um, in fact, uh, actually, Comac was looking at Huawei uh, why? Because Huawei did a whole thing to really look into their program management, like, you know, with all those problems that uh, Doug had just mentioned. And they hired a whole team from IBM for a, a span of quite a few years to really diagnose the problem, how they can improve their program management. Um, but anyway, it's not just the program management. Here, the whole uh, paradigm has changed. The whole aircraft is going to be changed. And the whole design space is open. Because if you just keep on designing those airplanes and hang a couple engines in the, on the wing or in the back, you're not going to survive. So, um, so it's really very exciting. And uh, here is just already appearing on the uh, competition landscape. You can see this is an uh, Airbus roadmap going from their E-Fan, which just a couple years ago really uh, rocked the world. And so uh, they're already moving on to here to these megawatt classes hybrid for the uh, regional jets. And of course, Boeing is not too far behind uh, with the uh, Zunum Aero supported by Horizon X. Uh, in Israel, we have the aviation. Uh, here, of course, Ampere, we have uh, our, this is what we call the tailwind. So you, you go from very uh, unconventional uh, platform here, uh, though Zunum and Aviation still just go with a conventional detail, we totally got rid of the tail here for more, uh, for more affordability as well as uh, performance. So in China, what's happening? In fact, I went to give the talk and um, also met with the uh, experts here. So this, uh, this is a um, Professor Yang, Yang Fengtian. He is actually the leading authority in China for electric airplanes. And um, his team, and this man is from uh, Sanin Yaosu, which is sort of their uh, research group under AVIC, collecting a lot of the international uh, uh, leading research intelligence. And so visiting with them, and this is a real uh, research thrust over there. And finally, I just wanted to conclude by saying this. Okay, this is the same picture as Scott's. Uh, except this one, uh, Mr. He is in the picture. Yours have only <laughs> Mr. Jean. <laughs> but I think Mr. He is really going to lead Comac and, uh, and bring out the innovation element in this whole thing because they can't just keep on copying. And also, even though they have the will to make all these large aircraft, they recognize that it's really the innovation that's going to lead them to, um, to be competitive. And um, as you can see, this, I, I didn't make this chart. Uh, this was a chart from uh, Comac. It says, 用创新赢得我们共同的梦想. 
So Chuangxi means innovation. And I think that's something we should be worried about. OK, thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Susan. The, the ground up view and also looking at the different kinds of technologies or in, in, in ways that, and also new generations of Chinese that may be able to adapt to them. Um, certainly an important part of the picture because uh, we're also we're obviously looking at things that we can't that are in the future that we can't predict and it's nice to see uh, some of the possibilities that are out there let me turn now to Todd to talk more about the possibilities since you've also engaged in the Chinese avian industry on a number of fronts including your ongoing venture if you could share with us perhaps a, a glass half full or maybe three quarters full view for why optimism is is more warranted um, and why pessimists like myself um, may be missing some of the milestones or possibilities that are out there, um, and 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 then wh and which would explain why Boeing and Airbus and others are always looking over the shoulder, um, because uh, it's a competitive landscape. So let me turn things to you. Okay, thanks. So uh, well, first I'd like to thank the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies for, and Dr. Scott Kennedy for inviting us here to have this extremely well-organized event, which is very timely. Um, now, raise your hand if uh, you've had the privilege to spend any amount of time in China. So you might recognize, if you have, uh, where you stand on the China expert chart. <laughs> Personally, I, uh, I passed the maximum hubris uh, line about five years ago. <laughs> so I can confidently say to all of you that you know, the more you learn about China, the less you realize that you actually know. So uh, you know, China is a huge country. And you know, it has more languages than Europe. It has more people living in Shanghai than all of Canada. They produce all the cell phones in the world, uh, including the iPhones probably sitting in your pocket right now. Maybe it has a chip on it. Probably not. Um, while it might be expedient to paint things in, you know, into a black and white, there's really nothing more gray, uh, ambiguous, and mysterious than trying to understand and break down the psyche of the Chinese civilization. And it's complex and complicated and indeed turbulent relationship with the United States. And speaking of turbulence, um, you know, on my flight in to DC from Asia, I flew on a Boeing aircraft, very nice 777, always a smooth ride, powered with British Rolls-Royce turbofan engines, and operated by the world-class Cathay Pacific. So if you think about the economic value that the air traffic demand for my ticket generated, it directly benefited the American, the European, and Chinese economies. And that's really the beauty of the aerospace industry. By default, it is international in nature. It's a network of very high value assets. And these are the pinnacle of human engineering and multilateral cooperation. And this is creating the physical internet of the world that brings us all together. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that all these nation states see this as both a matter of prestige and strategic importance. And that's what I think the focus of the discussion is today. So aerospace trade and cooperation between the United States and China, it does go back nearly a century. In fact, at the start of the 20th century, Boeing hired its first engineer, Wang Tzu, a Chinese student sent to study abroad at MIT. He learned to study in New York, and he helped design Boeing's first successful product, the Model C. And the US Navy even went to go buy 50 of those. Decades later, during the Second World War, Pratt & Whitney, another iconic American brand from the aerospace industry, powered the famous Flying Tigers in the fight against the Japanese in World War II. We then came back to China in the 1970s after the Cultural Revolution finished to normalize the relations. And if, if you look at what happened with the market share there, Boeing basically achieved a near monopoly on the commercial airline fleet until about the uh, 1990s. Yet today, the same market share has actually declined down to about a 50-50 split with Airbus. So they have options. So looking forward, I think the question is, should we be concerned about China and specifically COMAC? 
So from my perspective, building an Airbus and a Boeing is a challenge, like the other three uh, um, guests here have said, is, is it, it's a challenge of management and culture. You know, the, the dominant design of a jet-powered aircraft has essentially been established since the 1950s, and the industry really has consolidated, you know, under a few very large companies since then. We've looked at 10 to 15 percent improvements in each generation of technology, and it's largely coming out of the power plant and the avionics efficiency gains. So really new propulsion systems, like what Susan uh, is talking about, are needed to make any kind of uh, real big step change step changes in uh, air travel efficiency. So really what the competitive advantages that Boeing and Airbus have is in integrating the systems, managing complex supply chains, conducting lengthy sales campaigns that are international and complying with multinational policies. So I think I'm in agreement with what the other three speakers have said so far. Um, and this requires strong organizational culture and tribal knowledge. Another interesting thing to think about, though, in the context of China is that Boeing and Airbus have been transitioning their companies into more service-oriented businesses. And it's their ability to define and control these aviation ecosystems that builds a moat around their business. But I think that might also be creating a kind of Achilles heel. For creating a GE and Pratt, it's a much bigger challenge. That would, China's equivalent for that would be what's called AECC. Um, that's a huge challenge of trust from the regulators and the operators that would ever use that equipment and the technology. So what's on the upside, as you said, like glass half full for China? I do think COMEC has a long-term strategic advantage. Uh, as we just saw in Susan's photos, it has a group of engineers that'll be reaching 40 or 50 years old, and they'll probably have two or three and hitting their third development platform that they all work together on by that time. So we'll have the C919, the CR929, regional jet, and then maybe they move on to a next gen platform. And, and that could be uh, the same period of time. What we'll see is the baby boomer core of Boeing's workforce retiring. And that's a lot of experienced engineers. So in the early years of the US space program, you know, U the US had NASA, and that was also a very centralized organization but they still seem to be able to get a man to the moon, which was a huge feat. You know, building the C919 and the CJ1000A engine, those are also national imperatives for China. So I think we all do agree that we'll actually get it done. But, and, and, and there will have a, a great motivation for any of those young Chinese engineers. Uh, they would love to have uh, an involvement in that kind of a program. So for any technology, creating and mastering it, it's really a matter of time and money, and China really does have both. China puts out about 4.7 million STEM graduates every year. I think it's about 300,000 aerospace engineers. The US is a much lower number than that. So you can argue about the quality and the creativity and the education system, but there's still gonna be you know, a very large number of there will be a critical mass of very capable, talented engineers coming out of that huge pool, regardless. And if you look at Airbus, uh, I know it's not a you know it's it's not a perfect example because Airbus has uh, in its in its uh, uh, predecessor companies a history, but it still took them several cycles, two or three cycles before they could get to the success of the A320. So what I'd like to end with is a little bit more of a global view on the manufacturing transportation technology and, and why I just allude back to my previous point about the Achilles heel. You know, a common thread is that you see a lot of these companies are starting to servitize their business models. And I think the servitized business model is going to be increasingly vulnerable to decentralization, uh, commoditization, mass customization, especially in the aerospace industry. Um, Technologies like blockchain will be used to increase the convenience that we can automate some of the certification aspects of this mass customization in highly regulated industries. Uh, it'll also be a method for them to monetize the decentralized future while these asset intensive business models go the way of the dinosaurs. I think additive manufacturing will lead to decentralized manufacturing which will lead to a decentralized supply chain that will bring new competitive threats to those business models that are being adopted today. So when we look at things like hyperconnectivity, 
and increasingly open borders. When you look at countries like Japan, Germany, Singapore, these passports, you can go to 190 countries without even needing a visa. So this further enables this idea of like a distributed organization that can tap brain power from around the world. And these are the type of companies that are going to be influencing our industry. So you know, Chinese can manufacture their own cars, but their consumers still love to buy Audis, Lambos, Teslas. They, they can manufacture phones, but they still love to buy Apple and Samsung. So you know, for us as a country, we can look at, like, do we want to take a strategic position and get these assembly line jobs back? But really, it's, it's all going the way of decentralization and automation. So we need to focus, and I believe this is what China will, with these kind of COMAC uh, uh, programs, focus on, is the high value jobs where the human element is needed in the future are going to be on creativity, strategy, and compassion. And most of the governments in the world are trying to figure this out and how to take care of their people. So I firmly believe that if we're going to live in a world where the aerospace industry and you know, the likes of Musk and Bezos and Boeing and GE take the steps for us to become like an interplanetary species, it will be done together with the combined wealth and human capital of China, India, Europe, the Middle East, and the United States and North America. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my comments. And I'm happy to talk further about uh, Terrific, Comac. Terrific. Thank you so much, Todd. I really appreciate that. Um, it's, I think it's really important um, for, uh, to think about what are the potential disruptors out there, whether it's technological, organizational, um, uh, for, for an industry like this. Uh, because that's, we, we need to think big. And, and, and so I really appreciate uh, your, your comments giving us that perspective. Uh, I've prepared other questions, but I, I don't want to ask my questions right now, actually. Uh, you, and you've all heard enough from me as well. I want to give the audience a chance, uh, because we've gone a little bit longer than what we were planning for the presentations, but I want to give you all a chance to ask some questions. Uh, if you would, we've got microphones. Uh, we're on the internet as well. So if you'd, wait, if you'd raise your hand, wait for a microphone, and then um, stand up and uh, identify yourself and keep your question relatively short. That'd be, that'd be terrific. Who'd like to go first? Yes, we'll come right there in the middle. Sure. Hello, Eric Rosenthal, TechRow. Um, my question is about uh, global integration and uh, One Belt, One Road, actually. Um, I was wondering if there's been any effort by China to um, have their certifications met in some of these partner countries, um, if this is maybe part of a longer term effort by the party, by the Communist Party to uh, spread the C919 or future COMEC programs to these partner countries like India, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, anywhere else on the Belt and Road program. Thank you. Anybody? Yeah, ab absolutely. So the, uh, you know, OBAR, One Belt, One Road, um, the, not just the C919 and the ARJ21, but you know, as some of the other speakers mentioned, uh, like the high-speed rail, building out infra really about infrastructure and transportation. That's absolutely uh, part of their strategy. And um, of particular importance are those countries in like Central Asia, in uh, Southeast Asia, countries like Myanmar, Laos, uh, and in Africa. So this is where these countries will uh, you know, due to the political relationships, likely, uh, you know, accept Chinese uh, standards and Chinese certifications and operate those aircraft. I mean, they do already today. And uh, in the future, if the C919 is able to industrialize or the later programs, I would anticipate one belt and one road have laying the foundation for those, uh, you know, programs to enter those markets. Thoughts? Um, yeah, they, there are already uh, a few orders from Africa and Southeast Asia, for example. Okay, who would want to be next? Right here, second row. Hi, Michael Bruno with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, two questions, um, one for the China experts, uh, veterans <laughs> there. Uh, I've asked Randy Tinson, the, the chief salesman at Boeing, you know, what are the big macro risks he, that they watch? And I was surprised to hear that he looks at high-speed rail development in China as a key threat to the overall Western aerospace uh, business model. So I'm curious as to your comments there. And then, Doug, a question for you on Airbus. 
moving into China, what's the potential for Airbus to try to exacerbate U.S.-China tensions and move more production capacity into China? Um, I could say a little bit about the rail and then others could contribute as well. Um, I totally agree um, that it's a, it's a huge challenge for the commercial aircraft sector uh, because you can get uh, across China to just about any city uh, extremely quickly on high-speed rail. I think there have been some studies that show the time it takes uh, if you start in Hong Kong or go to some other place, uh, what you can do in about four hours' time. It's, 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 and at, the, at that point, then you're thinking of beyond, a, uh, say, 1,000 kilometers or 1,500 kilometers, then you're really competing with aircraft uh, because of the, the short the time. Chinese airspace is still you know, heavily controlled by the People's, People's Liberation Army. And that has created real challenges in terms of on-time performance. Uh, you do not have those problems whatsoever in high-speed rail. Uh, and then I guess if the Chinese or the Japanese do a lot of exporting of high-speed rail, then that'll be a challenge elsewhere. So I think it's, it's, it's at certain distance that high-speed rail might be uh, a, a high competitor for. But I think once you get beyond certain distances, uh, then probably you've got uh, in an aircraft being the more likely choice. Uh, but of course, maybe we'll have different types of aircraft, different types of delivery. So it won't be just about us all showing up, and several hundred of us getting on the same plane and going to hubs or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually I did get a chance to talk with uh, Randy about that a, f a few years ago when it was really just ramping up the high speed rail. And, um, and it still is an interesting topic today. If you look at China, they, they don't have very much uh, regional aviation at all. Um, they have one airline, Tianjin Airline, that operates almost the entire fleet of uh, regional jets. Uh, in fact, they're mostly all Embraer uh, uh, ERJs. Um, there's pretty much no turboprops in, in the country. Um, and. Uh, you know, when you do have the convenience of high-speed rail, it, it, you know, if I can go from city center to city center, why would I want to uh, spend the time going through airport security? Uh, I think even Europe has that to an extent, and there's been lots of analysis on that. One interesting thing is China is really good at building out these multimodal uh, transportation hubs. So the, um, you know, the high-speed rail and the airport uh, facilities are integrated you can actually take high-speed rail and then go long haul on an aircraft. So your journey is actually combining the two. Um, I think a major competitive threat for the aerospace industry, or the aerospace industry needs to get involved in that, is also the, uh, you know, the hyperloop type of transportation systems of the future. So that, that could also uh, be a major disruptor. And um, you know, maybe even companies like Comac should uh, try to develop like, that aspect of, of, indus of the industry. So uh, I, think, I think that high-speed rail is a kind of early indicator for what some of those other uh, technologies uh, that are coming, uh, or infrastructure technologies like Hyperloop are going to do to the aerospace industry. And then the aerospace industry will have to look further out you know, to the, you know, flying to the moon, flying to low, low Earth orbit, uh, as, as this becomes more of something that people do. So the industry will continue to like have, it, have its purpose, but the way that we move around on the actual Earth could very well uh, be quite different in, in 10 or 20 years. And I, I also do think a lot of it will be the electrified aircraft, like what Susan, Susan's working on. Yeah, so, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was going to compliment on what you were saying regarding the uh, high-speed rail. Um, I think rail where possible, but if you look at the Chinese geography, there's a huge part on the, on the west, southwest part that are really mountainous, doing rails. I mean, if they could have done it, they would have done it a, a lot earlier. I mean, they do have a couple of rails that, go, that goes through all the mountainous region, but it is very hard. Um, that said, I think just now another word that you know, Todd mentioned was the turboprop. They have less, a lot less than the west, uh, particularly than US. And now uh, some of the economics, for example, for turboprop is, is, uh, is just really uh, not competitive when it comes to uh, these particularly short distance. Like the ARJ was originally uh, decided because they wanted to use the ARJ for the western part of China, yeah. connecting all those cities. But you know, even jets 
with uh, that jet distance and everything is still quite inefficient comparing to, for example, all the electrification of airplanes. So, you know, with a turboprop, you virtually lose 70 to 80 percent of the efficiency when you, you know, just go up, you know, converting all that chemical energy to kinetic energy to drive the prop versus, you know, electric airplane, you can have 98 percent of the efficiency. So, you know, in the affordability chart, it's like one one hundredth of the cost of something like turboprop. So you bet Chinese are working on that. And I showed, for example, that one chart that's led by this uh, Yuan Shi. Yuan Shi in China is like the, the Academy of Engineers. It's like the highest level. Like um, in the US, I think there's only like, you know, maybe hundreds of the Academy of Engineer fellows, really high level people leading this effort. Now think for a minute, not only the affordability part makes sense, but emission makes sense. And also another thing is that, you know, we're all talking about the standards and everything. Now China has the largest electric cars market, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. I think they did manufacture the largest, uh, the highest number last year. Yeah. And uh, in the automotive industry, they, they totally missed the boat. I mean, for example, if you have a Tesla and tomorrow, you know, your son or whoever has a, a GM or, you know, a Toyota, or these electric cars, they don't use the same charger because there was no standards agreed initially. So right now in our aerospace industry, China is actually taking the lead mm. in the uh, infrastructure part. Yeah. And guess what? When they do that, because they're building all these new airports, they're building mm. something like 500 new airports out west. Yeah. And so what can they do? They can standardize all these charging infrastructures, right? Mm. And not only, it's not just the physical uh, adapter type of thing, but it's also like the voltage, the current, and, and all of that. So that is actually something that's alarming, that um, you know, it could be taking the lead of the world. Yeah. Like yeah. the leap, leapfrog, just like back in, you know, earlier when we have these, uh, you know, cell phone industry, because they, they simply didn't have the original infrastructure. They yeah. could just jump, leap, leapfrog to it. Straight to 4G. Yeah. I, I don't, and and I think long term, and I, I don't disagree at all, but I, I still think to Randy's comment, um, yes, it is a threat, but I think there is still a very significant part of the network as China grows, point to point network, that's going to be served by narrow body aircraft. And that's why you've seen such massive numbers of orders. Um, you will see more. So I think, at least for now, I think you'll still see high speed rail and and point-to-point -point travel on, uh, on narrow-body aircraft complement each other. But, you know, I, I, you know, Randy's looked at this a lot, so um, uh, I think there is an evolution that way. Now, you asked about Airbus. Um, I, you know, there's a, a, a lot of view, because Airbus has a final assembly line in Tianjin, that Airbus has much more activity in China. I don't think that's a correct view. It's of different types. Boeing has not put a final assembly line in, but they have a lot of activity in China. And you can actually see over time how the two companies play because you can see the Chinese decide to place an order in what's a fairly arcane system of ordering aircraft. They can place an order with Boeing or place an order with Airbus. And that often depends on what the companies have done for China. So putting a final assembly line in, in Tianjin, actually led to an Airbus order that happened kind of coincidentally with that. Um, you've also seen Boeing play a long game. They have a very a pretty important composite facility in Tianjin and a lot of other activity there. So you've got both companies have to continue to put intellectual property and activities in China in order to ensure they get the next order. I'd also add that the politics are important because there have been times when China decided to go with Boeing because of emission trading schemes in Europe or on the other side because of U.S. weapons sales to Taiwan, they may go with Airbus. So it's always been a political lever and in fact, I think it's very important right now when you look at um, concerns about tariffs and trade wars. Uh, I, I think it's important that you've seen no move by China to put tariffs on Boeing airplanes. And they need the capacity, but they also, I believe, want to always be able to play both sides and be able to work with both manufacturers and always have leverage over 
other, other strategic issues. So that means you think they probably will never just choose just one over the other permanently. It'll always be short-term pain or very specifically targeted type of activities. Oh, a absolutely. I think it's just too important in, um, in, in both the connection between how they use the aircraft industry and political uh, strategy as well. Yeah. All right, let's see if we have time for another comment or two, right here in the front and then here. Why don't we, we'll go, we'll just take all the comments and then give everyone one last chance to answer whatever you'd like to. The, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, uh, I'm Brandon Hughes from FAO Global. Uh, quick question regarding uh, aviation flight training. I recently came back from a, a conference and I talked with uh, representatives from Guani Aviation and they're making a small little, they call it the GA-20, small little four-seater um, prop aircraft. And we were talking about training, and they were saying that there's still such a huge gap between the training pipelines that are needed versus the industry. And obviously, we see from industry reports that there's a huge demand and a growing gap, especially by when you look out to 2030. Um, do you see an emphasis on pilot training in conjunction with these indigenous development projects? And have you seen any, seen any substantial changes in policy or promotion of actual flight training that um, is going to provide uh, Chinese pilots for these. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. Let's go right across the aisle and then we'll go to the back. Thanks. Um, Owen Church with the South China Morning Post. Um, I had a question about the panel's thoughts on, on China's capabilities for insulating itself against potential international disruption, thinking particularly of the U.S.-China tr uh, trade war. Um, I think if I'm correct in my understanding we, ha we saw the, the, the delivery recently of, of Chinese-made landing gear for the, for the C919, which I, uh, I assume would, would, they would look to uh, replace the Honeywell landing gear with. Um, and then obviously yesterday's case, the indictment might suggest um, an acceleration of developing the, the uh, indigenous engines. So I wanted to he hear your thoughts on, um, on moves to, to look to insulate the, uh, the Chinese aircraft sector. Thank you. Terrific. One more in the back, and then we'll... we'll let the three of you respond. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade, along the same lines of the last question. My knowledge is that U.S. technology is embedded in so much of the high-tech aircraft stuff that if the U.S. says don't export something, it has quite a reinvigoration because so much of goes over. If Mr. Trump really wanted to, quote, stop or slow up the Chinese industry and use whatever power he had available to him, could he still have an impact on that? Thank you. Terrific. All right, so two, largely two areas, one about training and people, the other about uh, the flip side of the previous question in the earlier round, the leverage that the United States has in terms of technology dependence that China may face. Uh, why don't we start with Doug and then Susan and then uh, Todd to finish off. Okay, first uh, a quick comment on the pilot issue. You know, there are real pilot shortages globally right now. Um, it certainly is an important area. It was interesting, I was in uh, Prague a couple weeks ago for um, ISTAD Air Finance, and this was a topic there. Um, and I would say, though, the broad consensus is there is a pilot shortage, but that globally the industry is responding to this and that this is getting addressed. And if one is looking for barriers to growth in airlines and growth in sales of commercial aircraft, whether it be from China or elsewhere. Um, I mean, the, the general consensus I find, this is not the bottleneck. There w the pilot training will come along and it will be there. And that's a better outlook than I think most people had a couple years ago. Um, okay, so regarding uh, training, there are a couple of things. Um, I, I totally agree that this is a global thing. And um, some of you, if you're uh, ever in a U.S. small airport, you'll see lots of Chinese uh, pilot students are sent here. You know, I'm from L.A. area, and uh, the L.A. airports, quite a few of them have the trainees from China. And um, so that's the one aspect. A lot of them come over here. Why not do it back in China, right? In fact, they're trying really hard, but the thing is that the, the, what's stopping them is the airspace. 
as you know, that the Chinese <coughs> airspace distribution is kind of the reverse of the U.S. While it's over here, you know, we have 90 some percent that's uh, civil airspace and the rest military and, and um, so on. But over there is the other way around. So um, if you recall that first chart I had, the title chart, that was a place that's called Jiande. And Jiande is a place that much like Zhuhai, because uh, Chinese are uh, making these little pockets of uh, civil airspace. They're st starting to open these little um, pockets so that people can try out in terms of training and doing other commercial type of uh, flight business. So that's one change in, in the Chinese policy. And so in the next decade, I think you will see more and more of those as new airports are popping up, new airspaces will be popping up. And then, uh, and by the way, they're collaborating with NASA on that one. And then in terms of uh, also training that's very exciting in China, that is, uh, while it's over here, we use these uh, you know, 40, 50 year old Cessnas and Pipers and so on for tra training, and much like everywhere else in the world. In China, they're just jumping into electric airplanes because especially those two seaters, new electric airplanes, they, they're like one tenth the cost you know, to start out comparing to even the 50 year old Cessna. So that's something that I think they could also leapfrog uh, in terms of training. OK. Um, I think Susan's far more qualified to answer the training question than I am. But I will uh, address the uh, last two questions from the uh, SCMP regarding the, what could happen if we uh, keep going down this road with China. And instead of you know, the relationship normalizing, it continues to deteriorate. What I could imagine happening um, is, let's say 2019, 2020 comes around, and whether it's by oil or the dollar or Chinese real estate or something else cyber related, um, we enter th into a big financial crisis. And during that crisis, um, we see uh, air traffic demand just drop. And there will be a short-term but very severe correction in the aircraft delivery super cycle that we've been in for the last, basically, as long as I've been in this industry. And that's when they will hammer us really hard in terms of the United States for the uh, trade tensions. And that will be very painful and disruptive. So I could imagine a uh, bit of a scenario like that occurring you know, in the next one to two years. And that's a big risk that we should uh, consider. Um, and I don't think we have to uh, go down that road. Um, I think that if we look at China and the US relationship over the last 100 years, it's had a lot of ups and downs. There's been changes in both governments. I mean, not even 30 years ago, or we were, they were operating our Black Hawk helicopters that we sold to them. I'm sure there's a lot of aerospace and defense companies that would love to have those kind of days return. And who's to say that it might not? There's geopolitical reasons for why you know, the trade dynamics change over time. Um, and you know, we're, our government now is making moves that are really, uh, you know, we're not, the status quo is no longer there. So things are changing. It could change better, could change worse. It's going to require, um, you know, an increased uh, uh, amount of diplomat diplomacy in how we handle the, the US-China relations. But uh, I could see that timing of when this, uh, you know, there's no tariffs right now, but when the tariffs do come, it'll be at the worst time for us. And it won't be like in 2009 where China increased consumption and increased infrastructure, and that had a, you know, that drove sales to Boeing, just sales to Caterpillar and so on. So we already seem to have maybe forgotten those lessons. But that's what I could see happening in the future. This has been a terrific discussion, um, less because of the, the few ideas I threw out at the beginning, and more for the, the comments that Doug, Susan, and Todd offered together with the conversation with everybody. I think what still jumps out at me is um, a picture that if you take a linear view and look at, think of change as linear there's, uh, and gradual, there's reasons to be quite doubtful or, uh, and, and see the, the challenges that China faces. 
Uh, and there's good reasons to think in a linear way. China has a political system which is where risk aversion is a high priority. The Communist Party is really powerful. These institutional and cultural legacies don't change very quickly. And so you could think, uh, and we also have a global industry where there's a few dominant players and uh, they also are trying to keep uh, order. Uh, and so you could see a, a linear trajectory uh, and, and it being challenging. The question is what nonlinear changes might come from within the industry uh, in terms of different types of technologies and business models or from outside the industry, geopolitically or otherwise, that make it have us to go back and, and redo the math on, on where things are likely to turn out. And, and it's hard to predict, obviously, but how, however, whether it's linear or nonlinear, then we are going to be faced with quite different types of, of outcomes. Um, so uh, even though my sort of prudential linear type of thinking may be reasonable and may be most reasonable for your institutional investors and the people who are really very careful about what's going on, uh, it's good to be creative and think about the big picture and things that, we, that are harder to, to put your finger on about what's definitely going to happen. So I hope you come away with the idea that uh, there's no one outcome guaranteed, that there's a lot of different possibilities uh, which are going to affect the industry and also how the United States is going to respond. Uh, I learned a lot uh, in, in, today uh, from the audience, uh, from each of you. I really appreciate you all making uh, the trip to Washington to share with us. I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you and watching your ventures. Uh, our report on this topic will be out in the next uh, couple months. And we look forward to receiving the feedback from all of you and from you. So if all of you in the audience would thank, uh, join me in thanking our guests today. Really appreciate it. Perfect. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs>